So this is where it gets really screwball because everything with God is over the top. Christ defeated Satan, so becomes king of kings. That's Psalm 110. It's a battlefield royalty, a battlefield victory. That's why he could justify saying, I will build church upon myself. Petra only means Christ in the Old Testament. Romans 10.4 even tells you that. It never means Peter. They're two different words. Peter is Petros. Petra is bedrock. I go through that in my Pope myth um, videos. Showing you the Latin and the whole bit. So Christ builds church upon himself. Where did he get the juridical justification to invent a whole new body of evidence in the middle of a trial about whether he's going to beat Satan? Because of the promise in Psalm 110. Battlefield royalty. There's two ways to become a king. One, you can just be born into it, and he was. King of David, you know, king like from King David. But the other way is to win a kingdom. He won the kingdom at the cross. He won Morning Star. So he's the firstborn of creation. It's another way you know the angels are paid for, but I'll cover that in a future video. Firstborn of creation, that's a term that's used in the um, book of Hebrews. Okay, so he's king of kings, that's his title over humans, lord of lords, that's his title over the angels, and you got those 24 angels that are sitting around him in Revelation 4 for that reason. Bright morning star. Revelation 2, 28, and Revelation, I want to say, 22, 18. You see this? Now where am I going with this? When you're getting Christ's head in you, you're on trial like he was, and this is the scariest part, he was awarded a kingship for beating Satan. You get his head built in your head, and you become a king too. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. 1 Corinthians 4, 8. Um, the verse in uh, Revelation 1 through 3 where Christ says, Don't lose your crown. Kratis hoekis. That's a rephrase. It means hold on to what you got. Don't lose your crown. That's used several times in uh, those chapters. I just don't remember the verses offhand. You see the point? You become a king because it's a parallel to what happened to him, and you're beating Satan too. And Paul, I mean, John makes a big stink about that when he says to the little ones in 1 John 2, Children, you have conquered. Well, conquered what? Satan. You do what Satan won't do. Satan will not believe in God. Okay, but that's not kingship conquering. You can conquer something small, or you can conquer something at a basic level, and then you can conquer it at an overwhelming level. It's like two guys get into the wrestling pen, and they hit each other, and over X number of, you know, hits, one of them's declared the winner, versus one of them hitting the other and psh, knockout. Versus two little kids fighting in the wrestling ring, one beating the other, or two adults, or the heavyweight championship of the world. You see what I'm getting at? There are degrees of conquering. So we're talking kingship conquering. We're talking learning enough Bible so that you become a king under him. Revelation 5.10 I already quoted um, the first Corinthians 4 8, where the Corinthians were all hot and bothered about, oh, we're going to be kings. And Paul's being real sarcastic with them, saying, Boy, I sure wish I had developed a kingship already. You guys are just so far advanced. Okay, 2 Timothy 2 um, 
2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8, where Paul gets his crown. You could add to that the crown uh, verse in 1 James. I want to say it's verse 18, somewhere in there. Chapter 1. And especially where Christ says, don't lose your crown. Hang on to what you got. And that's in Revelation 1 through 3. That you don't lose your crown. In other words, you and I and every other believer in Christ, in church, we are crown princes. Because we are in training to go through the same process Christ went through. And as a result of him going through that that process, he beats Satan, he's awarded a kingdom. Of course, all the kingdoms. You know, the whole universe. And that's in Isaiah 53, 12, and also in Hebrews 1. Okay, but if you're going to be a king under the king, then you're going to have a kingdom too. And like Paul was saying in Galatians, you're not going to inherit the kingdom if you're either, because that was the focus of his letter there, self-righteous or, you know, lascivious, you have to learn Christ, which is neither way. Neither one. Not self-righteous or lascivious. Okay, so Helel ben Shakar becomes Satan. That title instead goes to Christ. Psalm 110, Hebrews 1 and 2, expressly stated in Revelation 2.20, I want to say 2.28 and 22.18, and in Peter, day star rises in your hearts is usually how it's translated. And you're a dividend of Christ, you're part of the body of Christ, and it's going to need kings, because most people aren't going to grow up or care about learning and living on Bible, they instead are going to opt for Satan's good deed plan. So they're not going to be competent, just like Satan became incompetent. They're not going to be able to think. They didn't learn and live on Bible. They will be happy, but happy like a baby. Okay, so we need kings. And that's the over-the-top thing. There will be kings. You have a... You have a the will of God for your life on deposit in heaven says that you're supposed to be king, whatever your name is. And that's what Christ says in Revelation, I want to say three, don't, you know, hang, hang on to what you have, grasp what you have, don't lose your crown. In other words, it's already yours. But you can abdicate, you can refuse, you can elect against the will in Hebrews 9. So that Revelation 5.10, we will rule with him. Well, yeah, jointly, but, you know, you got Downton Abbey on TV coming up in January. Already started in Britain now. You got the Lord of the Manor. And then you got the kitchen maid. That's all a house, the ruling house. But not everybody in it is actually the head of the house. So yeah, we rule with him jointly as an office of church, as bride. But it's a harem. Not everybody in the harem is at the top of the harem. Not everybody in the White House is the president. But the White House has got its own rulership. Senate, not everybody in the Senate is at the top of the Senate, but as a group, it's got its own rulership. You see where I'm going with this? You got a senator, and then you got all the people who work for the senator. They are deemed to be part of the Senate, that senator's ruler rights. But they themselves don't vote. They're support staff. So you're going to have Christ king at the head and then all these other kings underneath him and each king has his own kingdom which is support staff. And his kingdom is filled with Christians who did not choose, just like Satan didn't choose, to have God pour his head into their heads. And that's what's so over the top. You and I. 
are each slated to become a king. Will we finish the course? That's what Paul's talking about in 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. He was totally surprised. I finished the course. It was a marathon race. You know, Olympics, marathon race. That's the kind of verb he's using. The Greek word is uh, truffle. He finished the course. It's a long race. As long as you live. And you won't know until you get to the end. Did you pass? It's pass fail. You die a king or you die a peasant. Along the way, you'll have had some moments where you did things or God grew you to do things or, you know... Just like in a battle where a guy might still be a private at the end of the war, but there was this moment when he jumped over the wall first, so he gets a reward for that. It'll be like that. And all of that is in your face to Satan. Hi. This is what my pouring myself into the creature can do. Why? would I want you to do it yourself? They're happier than you are. I'm happier than Satan, aren't you? I'm happier than he is. I'm total putz. There's nothing good about me. That has to just really rankle them. Here we are, these little disgusting humans with our little petty thoughts. And if we know God, we're happier than they are. There's nothing nice about us. There's nothing attractive about us. But we're happier than them. That's got to strike them as being totally unfair. So it's really in their face, this whole church thing. Totally in their face. Hi. I'm going to make you into a king under the king of kings. Or I'm going to make you one of the kings. Which way you want to go? And it's all God's doing. I can't do it. And it demonstrates to Satan, see, look. These little puny humans had it harder than you. They're more intimidated than you. And I accomplish more good for them than all the good that you did on your own, trying to bless the world yourself. Yeah, where did what it buy you? Didn't buy you any happiness, didn't buy them any happiness. Bought everybody a bunch of fantasy for a little while. You know, God isn't interfering. But because Satan's plan doesn't work just like communism doesn't work, God keeps bailing them out. And he can justify bailing him out. Just like the United States kept bailing out the communists in Russia. That would be at least seven or eight times they did that. God keeps bailing Satan out of his own jams. He uses us to do that because we need the world to be blessed. Because we're learning him that's justifiable because the world is not asking for God. The world is asking, is rejecting God. So... You reject God, you don't want God, you don't get God. But we want God, the few of us who are learning. The carnal Christian doesn't want God. He's too busy playing in Satan's kingdom. But those of us who are in the system, you could be a baby in the system, you can be an adult in the system. If you're in the system, God is blessing the world due to you. The amount obviously varies. But if you're, you got to be in the system or, he, or he's cursing the world due to you. In the system, what is that? You should know it by now. I've repeated it, but I'll keep on doing it. 1 John 1 9. Ask God to remind you to use it when you need it. Keep using it or you ain't going nowhere. No matter what else. Number two. Notice how this is dependent on your using 1 John 1 9. Ask God who's your right teacher. One male at a time. Any of this stuff on YouTube with me or anybody else is adjunctive. And no female is ever a teacher. Doesn't matter if the teacher's right. Doesn't matter if the teacher's wrong. It doesn't matter that he's male and it doesn't matter that God picked him out for you. Because that's the way God designed it. That's Ephesians 4.16. 
Ignore that at your peril. Third thing, learn and live on Bible under that pastor. And yeah, you can play with it outside of class. You can play with it, you know, sort of surfing around. But the teacher's first. And the teacher's primary. Everything else is just condimental. And you're trying to live on the Bible that you're learning under that teacher. And whatever he teaches that day, you must learn. Now, it doesn't mean that he has to be in your periphery. It could be on the internet. I don't know. You have to ask God who that is. That was always true. Paul was the teacher for a whole lot of people that he rarely saw. That's why he wrote the letters. That's why we have them. Same thing for John. Same thing for Peter. I'm sure they wrote a lot of other letters, but not all the letters were deemed to be canon. And you can tell that God was the one behind that, because when you read the content of those letters, you see how they fit. You always prove a divine source of a thing by the content. Not because some council says so. Anybody can claim to speak for God. But if God's really in it, the content of it will prove it. I'm relying on that when I talk to you. Because I really, this is like totally scary for me to be doing this. Especially because I'm female. I just keep saying to God, why me? But forget that. Number three was, learn and live on Bible under your male teacher. You know, number four is talk to God all the time. That's the system. Now, there's a number five that's optional that I just mentioned. You play around with the scripture with other believers. You argue. You don't argue. You discuss. You try to find out things. Fellowship means fellowship with God. It is not about being nice to other believers and having social life. This is, this is the most criminal thing about Christianity. When Hebrews 12, 10, I think it's 26 or 28, says, Do not forsake assembling yourselves. It means for Bible class. In those days, people didn't have tape recorders. They didn't have the internet. They had to physically go there because some letter from Paul just came. And they'd all have to sit together to read it. To hear it. It wasn't about them assembling together to have social life with each other. It was about them assembling under a didaskalos, a teacher. So that's another proof that, you know what, you're not in the system if you don't have a teacher. In other words, Paul would write a letter, the teacher would get it, the teacher would have a spiritual gift from God to explain for those people in his congregation. Pastor, teacher. His sheep. So when it says in Hebrews, "Don't forsake assembling yourselves," it doesn't mean going out and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have social life with Christians and that's fellowship. No, it's fellowship with God by means of getting the Bible in your head. Now, just because you have the Bible in your head, you got to do something with it, right? How do you know what to do with it? You can't bug your teacher. He's got to be busy studying so he can cook the food and, and serve it to you, you know, ideally one day, one hour a day. So you don't bother him. So maybe you go to the other fellows who are studying under the same teacher and you say, well, you know, he was talking about Samson and Delilah in last class. What'd you get out of that? And you bandy the stuff about because you're trying to understand what your teacher said. That's the best way to honor a teacher, is to learn what he said, not just parrot. And then maybe you go to somebody who disagrees with your pastor, or just is under somebody else, and say, you know, my pastor was talking about blah, blah, blah in Bible class. Do you, you know, what do you think about that? So you're practicing learning the information and using it. Just like, you know what, you get homework. You go to school, you get lessons from your teacher, then you got homework. Okay, but you don't just stop there. What was the purpose of doing homework? So you could practice the information you've been learning. Okay, was that all you do? No. You take what you learned from your homework and from class and you play with it with other people. But how much of that do you do? Well, you know, you talk to God about that. That was step number four. Talk to God all the time. 
That's God's system. If you're not in God's system, then you are cursing the world. If you are in God's system, then God is blessing the world. And the objective, in order to you know, God be in your face with Satan, because God's really trying to still save him, okay? You become a king. All those angels who rebelled are going to, you know, they're, they're like a loss to the kingdom of God. Well, they've got to be replaced. Guess who's the replacement? It was Satan's kingdom, remember? Satan was a little bunch of car. He fell down. He rebelled. Took a third of the angels with him. Okay, well now there's this big hole in the population. Guess what? Church fills that hole. And I want to say that's Colossians 5.14 or 2.14. And 15. Triumphal procession. You have to know the cultural reference to that. But the point is... This is this kingship thing is what you're in training to become as a result of Christ defeating Satan on the cross so that we are potential kings under the morning star Christ. Battlefield royalty, Psalm 110, Hebrews chapter 1 and 2. You can go read those things in translation and you ought to be able to see it. This is why Christ could invent church in Matthew 16, 18. It is a body of believers. It is not a religious institution. The head is Christ, not Peter. Now, if you happen to be a Catholic and that's how you want to go, that, if that's your prerogative. Because every kind of observance that you want to have, everybody's free to determine in their own free will. But the Bible says... Christ is the head of the church. Church is a body of believers being developed because of this trial issue of Christ thinking in your head on trial. And if you get his thinking in your head, you become a king. It's battlefield royalty because he defeated Satan. And that's why the contract changed from the Mosaic Law, which Christ fulfilled, and therefore the Mosaic Law was obsoleted, really set aside. Hebrews 7.28 Then church completes and then Israel still owed seven years so that plays out and then Israel's queen of the nations in the millennium and the church rules alongside her that's what Revelation 5.10 is talking about we rule with him with he's the ruler of Israel Israel's queen of the nations the Gentile nations got to be ruled by kings also that's when we come in it's a temporary thousand year thing. And then in eternity, whatever kingdoms you were awarded, what, because of learning Christ down here, they will be yours forever. And that's the future. And that's what Satan was supposed to have as his future. And he rejected it. So can we.